One of my uh, favorite seasons of the year uh, is baseball season. I love baseball um, and uh, love playing it when I was a kid, love watching it, love going to the stadium and, uh, and whenever I get a chance to. Uh, I bet you can't guess who I, who I root for. Anyone want to take a guess? The Yankees. That's a, an interesting guess. No. Uh, anyone else? The Cubs? The Cubs definitely not. Sorry. If I go to a Cubs game, I'll root for them, but otherwise, no. Someone said the Cardinals in first service. That's a big no. Um, what? Anybody guess? Tigers. The Tigers. Now, how, how do you know that? I, I don't know. May, maybe because you're wearing a shirt that says Detroit? <laughs> maybe. Yeah. It, the, so this is a, a what? This is an indicator of the fact that I root for the Detroit Tigers. And uh, yes, I am a glutton for punishment. I also root for the Detroit Lions. So I am a serious glutton for punishment. Um, but, but I root for the Detroit Tigers. How do you know that? You know that because there's an outside indicator that tells you he roots for the Detroit Tigers. And uh, I, I love being, uh, I love being in a, a state where most people don't because, um, like, if I go to a Cards game and they're playing against Detroit or I go to a Cubs game or, like, next week uh, they're playing the Brewers and, I, and I'm hoping for my 50th birthday to go up to the, the stadium and, and get to watch the Brewers play the Tigers, I'm going to be, like, one of five people in the stadium wearing Detroit stuff yelling and screaming when Detroit stuff happens, and everybody around me is going to be looking at me like, dude, who are you? Go back to Michigan. Um, but, but they'll know because I'm wearing Detroit stuff, and all the, all the Brewers fans will be wearing Brewers stuff. The thing is is that there's outside indicators of what's, what's reality in my life, and, and it's true in our soul as well. When you think about your, your soul, there are outside indicators that, that we can look at and see and go, you know what, I can see that or I can hear this or I'm interacting with you in this way and, and it tells me something about your soul. And, and the reality is, is, that, is that these indicators, we, we need to be very much aware of them because, because if not, if not, we, we may miss or we may misdiagnose or we may misunderstand what is going on inside our soul or we may deny what's going on inside my soul. I, I could say, I, yeah, I'm a Detroit Tigers fan, but underneath I've got a Cubs shirt. Some of you would be like, oh, that's so great. Um, some of you would be like, no, please, no, anything but them. The reality is, is that Every one of us, there's indicators that we can look at from Scripture that can tell us about the, the condition of our soul. And, and I praise God, I praise God because for quite a long time in my life, I was not willing to face up to those indicators. I was not willing to say, okay, yes, God, I agree with you. There's something going on in my soul and I, and I, and I need help. And, and, and I thank God for people in my life that, that loved me enough, that saw the indicators, that heard the indicators, that interacted with the indicators, and, and were willing to say, Jay, are you okay? And the truth was, no. In my soul, there was something off. In my soul, there was something not right. In my soul, I was not allowing God to have access to and fill me up. And it was drying up my soul to the point that others could see it. Why? Because there's outside indicators of the condition of my soul. And just as there is for me, there is for you. And, and the question I have is, is are we even aware of them? Because the truth is, is that the, uh, the, the condition of your soul impacts other people around you. It impacts your coworkers, it impacts your family, it impacts your friends, it impacts even your enemies around you. The condition of your soul impacts other people. And, and it's, it's vital for us to, to look at it and say, 
I need to be aware of what's going on inside of me. And if other people are seeing it, then I, I have got to be aware that what I do and what I say and how I live makes a difference in, the, in people's lives around me. And so, are you willing to recognize that your soul affects other people's souls? And, and, and if we're honest, if we, if we think about the Bible, the Bible was, was, a lot of it was written to the Jewish people. The Jewish people lived and understood and, and they, they centralized their lives on community on impacting one another, on caring for one another, on, on lifting each other up and, and being there for one another. And, and in essence, they were being the church to one another. And they understood the value of that. They understood the impact of that. They understood how one would affect the whole. They got all that, and Jesus is speaking into that in Luke chapter 6. And so if you would, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 43 through 45. And, uh, and, and what you need to understand is, is that Jesus is speaking here. He is giving the Sermon on the Mount, and in that, he is talking about the way we live our life and the things that we're allowing in our life and the way that we're interacting with others and the way that we do things makes a difference in the lives of others. He talks about the Beatitudes. I love that. It's the Beatitudes and not the do attitudes, by the way. The Beatitudes of who I am in Christ, of how that impacts other people. He, he talks about loving your enemies. You've heard it said, hate your enemies. I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And, and not only that, he goes on to even talk about judging one another. How can, how can you say that, that, that someone, your brother, has a speck in his eye when you don't even recognize you have a log sticking out of your own? Why are you judging other people? Do you not realize that the judgment that you're bringing upon other people will be visited back on you? And he's not only talking to his disciples, he's also talking to all the Pharisees that are standing there and Sadducees and all these religious leaders who think they're all that in a bag of chips. And the reality is, is that Jesus is speaking into their lives and saying to them very clearly, you have missed the point of being in relationship with me and you are impacting the lives of others in a way that is destroying their relationship with me and is separating them from me. And he, he is, why is he so harsh on the Pharisees and Sadducees? Because they are supposed to know better. They're supposed to know how to be putting the word of God into action and they're not doing it and they're leading people astray. And Jesus is not okay with that. And I'm so glad he's not okay with that. Because I, I don't want to be someone who's leading somebody astray. I, I don't want to be, like I said earlier, I don't want to be somebody who causes somebody else to miss the truth of who Jesus is. So, so Jesus has talked all about this other stuff, and then he gives them a, a metaphor. He gives them a, a word picture in verse 43. He says, for no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. The evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Indicator number one is what you say. What you say and how you say it is an indicator of the condition of your soul. And when you look at what Jesus is saying here, who, what is the trees? Maybe I should say who? People. He's not talking about literal trees. Like, like, oh my gosh, that oak out there. No, he's not talking about literal trees. He's using this as a metaphor, as a word picture. And he's saying, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is known by its fruit. How do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? 
Thank you, buy the apples. Oranges, orange tree. Nuts, there are some of them that have, there's trees that have nuts, right? That they, acorns, walnuts, all that kind of stuff. Some of y'all are crazy nuts. And so you're known by, we're all a little nuts, but yeah. You're, the tree is known by its fruit. And an apple tree doesn't produce oranges. And an orange tree doesn't produce apples. And, and, and Jesus is like, here's the deal. What you, what you need to understand is, is that what you speak, it will be one of two things in relationship to fruit or things that are, and again, think about this fruit. Fruit is not just for the tree. Fruit is for others. Fruit is, is for the good of others around, whether that's other trees that are going to someday grow out of it, or whether it's for individuals or animals or whatever. Fruit is always, and they would have understood this, for other people. In other words, they would have known what Jesus was saying when he was saying this, that it had a relationship to other people. That the good and the evil that comes out of our mouth isn't just about impacting our own life, it impacts the others around us. People. And so the good that he talks about here, the good is actually the idea of useful. I mean, does anybody, is anybody, well, I'm not going to ask this, because I don't want you to raise your hand and embarrass yourself. Um, could you imagine picking up an apple that is, is nasty and is, is uh, just rotting, thank you, uh, and got a worm coming out of it, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's good. Nobody does that. Maybe a few of you do, and that's why I'm talking about nuts and trees. But anyway, um, I, but most, no. Like, you're, it is not useful. It is not pleasant. Good is useful. It's pleasant. It's agreeable. It brings joy. It brings happiness. It honors the other individual. It builds them up. It gives life. It fills another soul up. That's good. Good fruit does that. Bad or evil fruit brings toil. It's annoying. It cripples. It causes pain and trouble. It heaps burden on. It takes life away. It empties another's soul. And Jesus is saying, your words are one or the other. Your your words are either good or they're evil. And, and what's interesting is, is that we could focus on this, and, and again, the words part is important. Do we need to evaluate our words? Absolutely. Because if you're an individual who is always critical and always down on everything and always down on everybody, and you have nothing good to say, and, and you, are, you are angry all the time, or you are whatever, frustrated all the time, and you're always talking bad about people, my friend, there is something going on inside your soul that is not right and is not consistent with God. That's not God Jesus talk. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so if, if you're in that place, and, and, and I, again, I cannot evaluate that, but if we sat down and talked to family, friends, and people that knew you well, what would they say about the condition of your soul in relationship to your words? And, and, and honestly, we can evaluate our words all from, the word of, from the word of God over and over again because there's all kinds of scripture that talks about, like Psalm 71, my mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all day. Is that true of you? Do you share the truth of Jesus with people? When, when I... It says, with the mighty deeds of the Lord, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. O God, from my youth you have taught me. I will still proclaim your wondrous deeds, even to old age and gray hairs. O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Is that that true of my words? Next verse, Proverbs 10, verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. In other words, it adds value to another individual. But notice what it also says. It says, the heart of the wicked is of little worth. Proverbs 12, verse 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. 
but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Are your words like sort of thrust somebody? Or are your words more healing? Again, we, evaluating your words, that's important. But I don't know that that's the most important thing here. Because I think what, what Jesus is getting across, look at verse 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil out of the abundance of the heart. What I think Jesus is getting at here is that we need to look at our soul. We need to examine how is our soul. And and one of the ways we can do that is by the outward indicator of our words. But that word abundance, it means to fill up. Fill up to the point of overflowing. So so I think the bigger question here is, is not do my words this that or that do is what I'm allowing to fill up my soul and my life good or evil? It is what I'm allowing to fill up my life bringing health and happiness and joy and healing and filling up my soul, or is it evil, and it tears down, and it destroys, and it sucks life away? I think that's the bigger question is, what are we filling up our life, our soul with? Maybe it's not just what, maybe it's who. The old saying, birds of a feather flock together. A lot of truth in that. Maybe maybe you're you know you're around people all the time that all they do is tear you down. All they do is say things that are, well, quite honestly, evil. And it starts to stick with you. I, I don't I, again, I'm not gonna go through a whole litany of what to evaluate and whatnot. I, I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit of God do that in your life because the reality is I, I'm not the Holy Spirit and I cannot do that. Um, and, and so it's not my job to do that for you. You need to ask God, God, is there something that I'm putting in my life that's evil? If there's, is there something that I'm not putting in my life that's good? That, that What do you want me to fill my life with? What are you filling your life with? See, the, the condition of your soul affects others around you. So what, what are you allowing to fill you up? Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes this. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Notice it's a capital S, Spirit. So what's that talking about? Be filled with the Holy Spirit, with God. Addressing one another in psalm and hymn and spiritual song, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So if I read this right, someone I can hear someone saying, so if I read this right, I get filled with the Holy Spirit and then and I fill up with the Holy Spirit, and then I start singing to people. Oh, my gosh, please. For some of y'all, don't do that. I'm saying that to myself. I'm saying that to myself. I know I do sometimes up here, and I don't know what that's all about, but, I, you know, whatever, it happens. Um, but that is not my natural gift to sing to you all. So, I can't believe none of you saying amen. Um, that's. Thank, thank you. All right, praise God. Uh, see, it takes one to know one. Um, that's good. She can sing. I cannot. Um, no, what, it, what it's talking about is, is speaking Jesus, speaking the word of God to one another, speaking, speaking the heart of God to one another, speaking what matters to God to one another, speaking in a, in a way that reflects Jesus to one another. That, that's what he's talking about when, you're, when, you get, when you allow the Holy Spirit of God to fill you up to the point of overflowing, and it overflows like a cup. If I were to take this cup right here and I start overflowing, and I start filling it up with water, what's going to happen is it's going to overflow, and it's going to hit my Bible, and it's going to hit my notes, and it's going to go on a table and on the floor, and, and it's going to affect others around. It's going to, it's going to impact other people around. Same thing happens when you allow whatever it is to fill up your life. It overflows out of your life, and then it impacts individuals around. It may be evil. It may be good. But the point is, it will affect other people. 
So what are you filling up your life with? The Bible makes it clear, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow God to fill you up. So, so here's the question I'm asking myself. Am I so filled with the Holy Spirit that what and how I speak confirms it? I was talking with a friend the other day. We were talking about this, this and, and I, I love what he said. He said, I, I want people when they're with me, I want to rub off on them Jesus. I want to, I want to, I want to impact their life in such a way that they walk away and they go, wow, that, that, that was time spent with Jesus. It's kind of like what I was talking about with Peter and, and the disciples as they spoke and people recognized in Acts chapter 4 and they said, those guys, they've been with Jesus. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know what, I, that's what I want. That's what I, man, I want that. I want that. I don't, how do I get that? I think number one, At least this is what I have to realize in my own life. Number one, I need to realize I'm my own worst enemy. D.L. Moody said this, I've had more trouble with myself than any other man. I love, uh, well, Paul David Tripp wrote this, no one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. We never stop talking to ourselves. We are in constant conversation with ourselves about God, about our others, about ourselves, about our meaning, about our purpose, about our identity, and so much more. The things you say to you about you, God, and life are profoundly important because they form and shape the way you then respond to the things that God has put on your plate. You see, you are always speaking to yourself some kind of worldview, some kind of gospel, some kind of identity. The question is, in your private moment-by-moment conversation, what are you saying to you? Man, I, that blew me up. Because the truth is, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, evil and good into my own life from my own head, from my own lips, about me. Speaking into my life all the time. And if I'm not filled with the Spirit, then I can tell you what happens with me is that what ends up happening is the lies that Satan throws my way, I begin to repeat those in myself, to myself. Does anybody else do that? Or am I just the only weird ball here? All right, good. We're a bunch of weirdos. That's awesome. Um, no, the... That's what I do. I, Satan whispers a lie into my ear, and if I'm not being filled with the Spirit of God, then I'm letting that resonate in my life, in my heart, and I'm saying it over and over again, and it's a lie that is not true about who I am. So, so what, do, what do I do? Jesus, what do I do? Check out verse 46. This is a very interesting question that Jesus asked. Why do you call me Lord? And you don't do what I tell you to do. We just stop right there. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Verse 47, he says, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. And then go on to verse 49. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who builds his house without a foundation. And when the storms of life come, it gets wrecked. 
That's the Borton paraphrase, by the way. So, so what is the key here? Here's my words. So sometimes I think we, we have the idea that the most powerful prayer that we could pray is our words to God. Is it possible that the most powerful prayer that could be prayed is God's words to you? Is it possible that the reason that I struggle with speaking to myself, the reason that I struggle with my speech to one another is because I spend too little of a time in the presence of my God. And the Shekinah glory of my God does not wear off on me because I've just spent only a little bit of time. Or I allow just a Sunday morning message from some dude, some guy up on the stage to be the only input of spiritual whatever in my life for an entire week or more. And again, I, I'm not saying you stop coming. That, that's... That would be ridiculous. But what I am saying is, if you're relying on what I'm saying to be your totality of spiritual input for your life, my friend, you are missing out on so, so much more that God has in store for you. You are missing out on so much treasure that God has for you if you would just simply yourself spend time hearing his word. How do you do that? Open up the Bible and get into it. Read the word of God. What is the greatest way, the number one way that God speaks to us is through his word. If you are not spending time in the word of God, you are starving your soul. And you are opening yourself up to the evil that will come out of your mouth. And and I'm telling you, if you want to be filled with the spirit of God, if you want to speak Jesus to other people, you have got to get into the word of God on a regular basis. And I don't mean just once a day. I, I hear people all the time say, I have devotions in the morning. I don't know about y'all, but when I have devotions in the morning, about 11 o'clock in the afternoon, I've, or in the morning, I've forgotten what I read in the morning. Or it's, become, it's been shelved because life has been coming at me. What if we got to the place where we spent, instead of making excuses of why I don't get into the Word of God, we would tell other people, hey, you know what, I really would love to meet with you, but I've got an appointment with Jesus. And I, and I can't meet with you right now. What, 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 if, what if we intentionally met with God like Daniel three times a day? Do, do you really think Daniel got down on his knees and prayed because he had to three times a day? Where, where in the Bible does it say, thou shalt pray three times a day? It doesn't. But here's what I know about Daniel. Daniel at an early age, at an early age, decided I will not be defiled by anything. I only will serve God. Is it possible that Daniel spent three times a day in and on his knees in prayer because he knew I am so needy of God. I am so, I have to be completely dependent on God. There's no way I can do this job that I have. He had one of the highest positions in all of the land of Babylon, and and he served faithfully God. Is it possible that he knew, I have got to spend more time with God so that I can effectively do the job that God has called me to do in this land? Because if not, I'm going, to get, well, I'm going to get driven down by all this Babylonian mess that I'm surrounded by. That, that's why I think he got on his knees three times a day at least. Because he realized, I cannot do this apart from God. I need God in my life. So he got into prayer. He got into the word. He got into his relationship with Jesus. Spending time with God on a day in, day out basis so that his life would ooze out God onto other people. 
man, what a difference you made. Again, some, sometimes we get caught up. Again, please don't leave here and be like, well, bless the Lord. Pastor today said that doing devotions in the morning is not a good thing. That is not what I said. I'm just saying that I don't believe that can be the only thing you do. Now, I don't know about you. I want to get to the place where every time the Holy Spirit nudges me, speaks to me, I obey him no matter what's going on. Driving down the road. Pull over this car right now, and I want you to pray for whoever. Okay, God. I, I just, man, I just know I need more and more of him, and apart from him, I can do nothing. Nothing. So what would happen? Here's another question for you that I'm thinking about, too. How would things change if we learned to speak Jesus? Really, the only way we're going to speak Jesus is if we allow Jesus' words to so fill up our heart and our mind, our soul, that they just can't help but come out of our mouth. Out of the abundance, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth will speak. And my friend, your words are an indicator of your soul. They are. Did you just close your eyes, bow your head? Worship team is going to come and lead in a song. There's going to be some people up here at the front to pray with you. There's going to be people at the back that are willing to pray with you. Um, and and what, why are they here? Why are they standing up at the front? Why are they standing at the back? It's so that if you would like to have someone pray over you, pray for you, that's why they're here is for that purpose, is to pray with you. They may not know you, but they're, they, let, me, let me tell you something about each one of them. They love you. They love Jesus, number one. They love you. They're willing to pray with you. There is no room in this building for any kind of judgment. Like, it don't matter what you're coming down for. If you want to come down here or to the back where people are standing and pray with somebody, it can be about what was talked about today. It can be a family need. It, it, whatever. If the Holy Spirit of God is nudging you to get up, move out, and come down and pray with somebody, just come down. You don't even have to tell them what it is. You can just say, I just, my name's whatever your name is, and I just need someone to pray for me. That's cool. That's what we want to do. But here's the thing, too. In being the church, one of the beautiful things that we can do is, is if the Holy Spirit nudges us to pray for the person next to us, we, we, can, we can say, hey, uh, I just really feel like I need to pray for you. Is that okay? I'm going to pray for you. And if they say no, then just stand there and quietly pray for them. You don't have to pray for them out loud. So be the church right now in this moment. The song is going to be sung. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus and that's what you need to do is you need to put your faith and trust in him. Again, you don't have to come forward to do that. You can do it right where you're standing, right where you're sitting. The beauty of Jesus is he meets you where you're at. He transforms your life right where you're at. That's a cool thing. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. He does that. So you can just surrender your life to him. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner in need of a savior and I need you. I don't know. I don't know what you need. I don't. God does. That's the beauty of him being God and me being me. I, I don't get to play God. I don't even want to try to carry that load. Forget about it. So, just a second, we're going to stand and we're going to sing this song. Whatever God's speaking to your heart, are you willing to say, yes, God, that's what I want? Let's stand. Let's sing.